writing. Welcome in into PDGA Radio, Dion Arlen, formerly of Stat Mando, now of the PDGA, but that doesn't mean Stat Mando has gone anywhere. Jennifer Allen and Grant Zellner with Dion today and thrilled to have you with us, Dion, because it's your month has been quite a whirlwind, yeah? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's been a great uh, Christmas present to close out the year to uh, join the PDGA and, and uh, it's been very exciting. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, I don't know how often you go to PDGA.com. I do every day because it's my job to put things on there. But we announced in mid to late December, we'll call it, uh, the acquisition of Stat Mando by the PDGA. And that means that Dion is no longer just an industry colleague. He is now my coworker at the PDGA all three founding members of Stat Mando join the staff at the PDGA. It doesn't mean Stat Mando is going away. Stat Mando now becomes one of the PDGA's several uh, brands within our family. And so if anybody's panicking right now, don't worry about it. You're still going to get your great content from Stat Mando following along with uh, your favorite pro events and that sort of thing. But this opens the door to a future of new products that you might enjoy but let's go back to the beginning first, Dion. Uh, can you bring our listeners up to speed on the history of Stat Mando? I have a feeling a lot of people really don't know how relatively new Stat Mando was and what caused its genesis. Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> to that point, yeah, we're only about three years old. Um, after the start of the pandemic, and I was sent to uh, work remotely from home, <clears throat> uh, having the, you know, luxury of cutting out the commute and being able to do my work uh, without the uh, classic office distractions, I found myself having a lot more time on my hands. And uh, at that time, I was trying to figure out a way that I could uh, add to the disc golf world and still be present in disc golf as someone who's been doing it for 20 years now um, <clears throat> and wasn't playing as competitively as I would have liked. So I tried to imagine different ways I could help in disc golf, and I had ran for a board position that year, which, if you recall, there were 17 candidates. So I was one of 17 people who had the same idea, hey, let's, let's try to give back into disc golf. Um, throughout that process uh, in 2020, you know, formulating what it was I thought I would be able to do and add value to the PDGA, um, thought through a lot of um, really data <clears throat> and digital experiences that I thought would be interesting and engaging and had that in my mind. <clears throat> and after that season where, where I didn't, you know, shocker, I didn't become a board member of the PDGA. I had uh, found myself on a podcast on Smashbox talking to Terry and, and JVD and talked through some of the things that I thought would be fun and interesting and subsequently got a tweet from Evan Kearns who uh, turned out to be uh, like-minded in his, in his desire to have something fun to do with uh, disc golf data. And uh, I responded to the tweet, said, hey, let's get together. Let's have a call. And another individual, uh, Hans Anderson, uh, also responded to that tweet, which is very fortuitous because he actually doesn't use Twitter. It's just a random instance where he was online and, and saw that tweet. So the three of us hopped on a call with some other guys, and we talked through what could be some fun projects, uh, fun things to do. And over the course of the next few months, it just pared down to Evan, Hans, and I. And in 2021, I went to the World Championships in Utah, and we debuted Stat Mando uh, and the head-to-head -head module, which was sort of the, the fun, engaging piece that we were kicking around, was the first thing that was live on our website, where we took uh, the tournament results from two players and matched them up against each other and let people have fun with that. So, And the stats and have been incredible. I will say from a player's point of view, like it's so fun, like randomly, you know, when I see one of the stats you've pulled up, I'm like, holy cow, I had no clue, you know? So as a, as a player <clears throat> and I'm sure as, as fans as well, it's really exciting, you know, for someone to do all of that work to look that stuff up is, is incredible. So thank you so much for all you do. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Super fun Jen. to look at. <laughs> Jennifer, I was going to ask you about the thrill of seeing your name in a Stat Mando, you know, nuggets of, of historical information. Is that just, is that one of those validating moments for you? Yeah, it's just really neat to see because like, um, 
I know like one time you popped up, like I'm the most winning female in Oklahoma. And then I think I surpassed Kat for FPO wins in Arizona now. And so it's like just l weird little things that it doesn't really have to do with a tournament. It's not like, oh, you won this tournament this week. It's like, this is your career history, you know, of accomplishments. So stats like that are, are really interesting to see because I definitely do not do the research. I don't even know what my score is when I play a round of golf. So um, things like that are, are, are really cool to see that, oh, wow, like I really have done that much. Well, Dan, you brought up uh, your fellow uh, compatriots there at Statmanda. You brought up Evan and Hans and uh, the roles that they play within your three-man organization. Can you talk a little bit about the development after those first uh, days, that first product, that public launch of the website, coming up with more and more uh, interesting ways to convey the data? Of course, uh, where where have you gotten all of the data to be able to then sort it and draw conclusions from it? And and what led you into more and more products that for most people, I think their exposure to those was probably on the Disc Golf Network while watching Pro Tour events. Just what's the creative process of bringing new products to market? Jen, thank you uh, for that compliment, not to, not to gloss over that. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, I can combine... Uh, all of that into a pretty simple answer for you, Grant, which is Evan, who is um, pretty much the, you know, I could make a case that he's the world's foremost disc golf researcher at this point in time, right? And his Accurate. appetite for um, consuming sports, analyzing sports, you know, formulating the stats, sharing the stats is unparalleled, right? So his passion for that really is what drives um, all of the the recognition that you called out, Jen, um, and the sort of excitement and personality that Statmando brings into the sport really comes from Evan. Um, so Hans is our sort of uh, architect who uh, was able to pull all the data together, together and form our platform. And then on top of those building blocks of the data that was comprised from PDJ results history, YouTube media views, Instagram profiles, you know, we pulled all those things together into our database and then started analyzing it and, and putting sort of, you know, building blocks and building blocks and building blocks. So anytime you might have an idea, like who's the winningest player in X, right? So, you know, Jen, you are the winningest player in, in Oklahoma. You know, we can run that question, that query across our database and answer that for any specific parameter, any location. That's right? crazy. So <clears throat> that's kind of the fun, you know, scalable power of, of having a strong uh, database with, you know, uh, relationship database where everything is fits together nice and neat and it's easy to interact with. Um, so we can credit Hans for piecing all that together and Evan for having the passion, you know, to, to share those sports stats. Um, I'll take a tiny bit of credit of just um, wanting to see these types of things be in our sport uh, and not, um, not waiting for them to happen. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that sort of characterizes stat Mando early on, which was we knew how possible it would be to do these types of things. And we didn't want to ask for permission so much as beg for forgiveness. So Grant, we <laughs> <clears throat> scraped the PDGA database, uh, which uh, was a bit of a risk, a bit of a gamble, right? But we felt confident that the value that we could provide would make itself apparent, right? So after debuting at Worlds, the following year, we went to the Las Vegas Challenge, met with Pete Christ uh, from the PDGA and had that conversation around uh, the use of data and, and um, you know, put some parameters in place uh, that were approved I mean, by the PDGA. it's kind of public knowledge, right? Like the PDGA puts their info out. So you're just, it's like reading a dictionary. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And <laughs> uh, I will take that support all day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there are other entities in the sport that may not uh, feel as uh, friendly to what you just described uh, as the PDGA was to us. But I think the, the biggest difference, too, is we weren't scraping the data so that we could go, you know, start a sports betting book and, and gamble right. on, on disc golf. Right. It, it was, hey, we want to uh, we want to extract the value of this information that's been sitting there for a long time and give it back to the community. <clears throat> And so we actually did spin up an open source themed community where we have uh, individuals we call stat elites 
um, doing this research and, and getting to dig into the projects and questions that they've had, you know, in their disc golf career. And they have, you know, read-only access to the database and can, can do the research. And in exchange uh, of, for that access and those tools, they help contribute to all the stats that you see on the platform. So it's a fun group to be a part of. Shout out to Statmando community. And if you are a researcher or someone who's interested in disc golf data, um, you know, shoot us a message and we can get you plugged in as well. So the website launches in uh, essentially the summer of 21, correct me if I'm wrong, Dion. And then yep, that's right. Um, uh, an even deeper relationship between Statmando and the PDGA sort of grows in the early stages of 2022. It was already there, but it's, it you know, really begins to formalize a little bit and start to grow. And we go through the 2022 season. We come into the 2023 season. Jennifer and I talk frequently about just the incredible growth of the sport, the, the speed and the exponential nature of it. Through all of that, you and the PDGA are, are talking Yes. And what was what was that pivot point that went from we're in the disc golf community to we could be a part of the PDGA itself? What what were the elements that came into focus and when did that start to happen? Sure. So <clears throat> last year or I should say in, in 2023, I'm already thinking it's 2024, but in <laughs> uh, in 2023, you know, we had gotten to the point where we had a steady revenue stream from the Disc Golf Pro Tour. We are the official data analysis partner of the Pro Tour, and, you know, we're behind the scenes piping stats into the booth in real time during broadcasts, um, doing the research, helping with the end of year awards, media packets, voter packets, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> our focus had been on the professional side of the sport, but our interest had applied to the entire domain of disc golf. So in, you know, having conversations with the pro tour and with the PDGA, we tried to weigh where could we add the most value and the PDGA serves the entire platform of the sport. And we wanted to push the value in that domain, right? So across the whole, the whole ecosystem. Um, so we are uh, going to continue doing the work with the pro tour behind the scenes, but we're going to look to expand all of the, the insights and data and analysis across all of, you know, PDGA competition. Well, you just stole my next question, which was <laughs> now that you all are part of the PDGA and Statmando becomes one of the PDGA's family of brands, and maybe you can't reveal, or maybe, maybe you can reveal some, but not others, uh, because you want things to be a surprise or things are in the works and they're not ready to be announced. But can you, can you provide any insight on future products, tools that the, you know, 90% plus of PDGA membership are amateur players, not, not the pro game. And even of those 10% that are pros, not all are touring pros, you know, what kinds of tools and, and various things can we begin to expect down the road? Sure. <clears throat> well, one of the things that I was really passionate about early on was, you know, the first module release was the head to head um, module where, we, where you compare yourself against another disc golfer <clears throat> or two pros in that instance, you know, I selfishly put myself in that pool of, of pros that you could compare against um, because I had tracked my competition against Nate Sexton, who Sexton families who got me into disc golf. You know, we all went to high school together. Uh, his younger brother, Colin, you know, is one of my best friends. So that fun kind of competitive rivalry that we had fueled a lot of the input into how could I, you know, analyze my own disc golf game. And looking at my matchup against Nate over time was, was a lot of motivation for me, right? And if I got, you know, a little C-tier win over him, it was like the best week of my life. So I suspect that a lot of players in, the, in disc golf, pro or amateur, have that rival group, right? Have, have those, those individuals, whether they're friends or frenemies in disc golf, that they want to see how they stack up against each other. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense and it will be a lot of fun if we can implement the head-to-head -head capability for everybody within the sport. So uh, we'll have to figure out how best to do that. Um, but I want people to be able to take themselves and take another player and combine their performance and then learn from that. What events did they do well against? What events did they not do well? And then if you add additional data to that capability, uh, then you can start to really analyze performance. And that's really the next sort of phase of the whole program, which is, you know, right now we have the tier of the, the event, the score of the event with the PDJ Live scoring app. Um, 
that was implemented in the, over the past few years will have actual whole scoring data as well. But once we start layering in things like, is this a wooded course? Is this an open course? Is this whole, you know, par three, par four, par five, more characteristics and more data, then you could actually show, hey, how did I compete against my rival on short par threes? Or how did I compete against my rival on right turning holes? Right. So now you get to start sorting and, and filtering your performance against very specific characteristics. That's where you can actually shape your opinion of how to improve your game. So both the player profile product and the head to head product with those additional data points, I think, become pretty fun and engaging and powerful tools to start shaping your your performance. That's like, do I sign up for this event or not? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, or, am exactly. I going to be able to just like click on my name and all these cool little stats come up now on PDGA? Is that, is that something that's in the works? Yeah, we got to figure out how best to, to implement it. You know, obviously there's lots of discussions. Do we do it on the Statmando website? Do we do it on the PDGA website? Do we just have a link? Does it all mean the same thing? You know, the future of, of the sport is really kind of open to be decided and that's something that I think is really exciting is you know we have all these capabilities all these tools now we're just trying to fit them together in a way that makes the most sense and is the most fun for players yeah the challenge almost is the packaging of the product as much as it is the product itself especially when we're talking about these digital products so that's going to be an interesting way of seeing how this as a benefit gets conveyed to PDGA members, you know, PDGA members, and you have already ingratiated yourself, Dion, with the membership team here at the PDGA. They are constantly looking for ways to enhance membership. In other words, why would I want to become a member or why would I want to renew my membership year over year? It, it, it's not selfish to say, what do I get out of the deal in this situation? Because you are giving up, you know, you're giving up an annual fee and you, you're, you know, giving up your support and other things. So what do you get in return? This becomes, it's untold yet how many different elements of return are going to come from this one acquisition of Statmando. And to Jen's point, some actionable data can come to different players. That's an interesting point you just made, Jen, about being able to look at your performance uh, on a certain course, knowing that maybe you'll be playing that course in the future and right. it telling you, oh, I need a little more practice there or, or you know, whatever. The, the cost of travel and, you right. know, like if, if this is a course that, you know, like we didn't have much woods in Oklahoma and I came <laughs> sure. to Arizona where there's really less unless I go up to the mountains. So I've never claimed to be a wooded player. I don't get the practice in the woods. So I definitely sign up on those big open bomber courses because I, they're super fun to throw. But that's something I've known. But actually like looking at the stats of how do I play on an open yep. course versus a wooded course would be cool to actually see. Well, maybe maybe I'm just fine in the woods and I just don't really have the practice. But I, you know, so it, it would be interesting to see, but there's yeah. a lot of play, like Holly Finley would not, you know, she didn't like Vegas because it was open and windy. She's used to the woods, right? you know, depending on where you've learned to play and the courses around you, the variety of courses, you know, if, if you live in a, a wooded area, those are probably your favorite types of courses. So yeah, exactly. It, it'll be interesting <laughs> to see if the stats actually follow along with how we feel as a player, you mm -hmm. know, our capabilities Absolutely. stack up. And that's, that's really sort of at the heart of the, of the, the concept, which is, you know, <clears throat> until you have actual data, everything's anecdotal and right. our sport is so young in comparison to other sports that everything is pretty much anecdotal at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the things that you can codify and quantify become fact and you know we want to add so much data into the mix that it becomes fact who's the best woods player of all time mm -hmm. you know when we say that today we're just speculating based on what we've observed which is not invalid but you can actually do better you can actually classify holes as wooded or not wooded on a scale you can take everyone's score across those holes and then you can answer the question Right. I think that was one of the, the tweets that went out recently about uh, Matty O. Matty O, correct? Yeah. <clears throat> awesome Woods player, right? Yeah. And that that 
and that's one that is maybe less intuitive because it's not obvious when you think of Matty O, you don't necessarily think, oh, great Woods player. But yeah. last year on tour, that's where he scored. So I was shocked to see that. That was one of the yeah. ones that popped up recently. I was like, really? That's not who I would have guessed as being the top MPO Woods player. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we want to take that ability to generate insights and apply it to everyone. Uh, you know, and then my my new job with the PDGA is sort of, uh, it's multi-layered, but the fun part of it is imagining all the cool stuff we can do. You know, Jen, you made a comment a moment ago, like having a, a toolbox to decide which events to play or not, right? Well, when I start to break that down in my head, if I was building my tour schedule for the season, yeah. right, what, are the, what are the lanes that I would need to evaluate? It's like, okay, distance and travel, that's going to equate to cost. Mm -hmm. Entry fee is going to equate to cost. How much has this tournament historically paid out now yep. that the event's up for registration? How much added cash is being advertised? You know, you could theoretically forecast a uh, itinerary for your tour that gives you all those data points. And then if you as a player say, I want to skip wooded courses, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, every time, you know, so-and-so is in the field. Which one's by pass. the beach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So now when you start inputting all those data points, you know, the fun part about um, like data products and technology is, yeah, if we can imagine it and if we have the data, we can shove it all together and build a tool that says, here's your tour planning tool. All right. Click no, the that'd button. That'd be so set great. Parameters it's so hard go. to make that schedule. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's scheduling stuff. Yeah. And so I saw that. I saw actually uh, some pro players, you know, for lack of a better word, complaining online about that recently as they're looking at the 2024 season. Sure. <laughs> And, you know, it's a, it's a problem that can be solved. That's what I think is exciting, right? That's great to hear. Yep. <laughs> so, so that's the goal. It's how do we put tools in front of people that actually add value? And, um, you know, Grant, you mentioned value and, and choosing to be a member. It's like these are things that add value 24-7, mm -hmm. right? You know, most people, I think, and, and I would fall into this camp, appreciate and value being a PDGA member because I play competitively and you know not only do I get a discount at the tournaments but I just I like supporting and being a part of that competitive organization right. and when it's the off season right and I'm not playing how much value am I getting out of my membership right in December I'm not playing any tournaments in January I'm not playing any tournaments right but I can use these online tools and study my profile and get insights about my performance and get value out of my membership with that digital experience. Yeah, that will, next next year I'm going to call you when I'm trying to plan this out. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. It was so <laughs> stressful, this, and I'm still going back and forth on if I'm changing. Like Florida Open, wintertime Open, you know, and and to be able to sit there and look, okay, like what would it cost me to go here, and what would it cost, yep. and how many players are here, and what's the payout, and what is the type of course here, and you know, having something extra besides a gut feeling of which way to yep. go is helpful. But yeah, this year was so weird trying to make that schedule for 2024. You know, I, I've played for a very long time and I have, you know, a stack of tournaments. I have played every year. I, I'm a right. repeater. Yep. I enjoy going, but I know the tournaments I love. You fall in love with the people in the town, the TDs, the support staff, you know, the courses you, you look like, I love goat Hill. Beautiful. Remind me of, you know, Perth, the rolling Hills, the beautiful eucalyptus trees, smell the ocean breeze. Um, and so I've been to that event for six years or more, you sure. know, a very long time. I can't go this year. You know, I can't go to that one. I can't go to Daniel Bow. Um, unfortunately, won't be able to play Beaver State. You no. know, I can't go back and try. There's so many events this year that they just didn't work. I'm like, how has the schedule worked for 20 some odd years? Mm -hmm. And then this year there was not one. There's just like a handful of kinks in the schedule. So who knows? Hopefully with some of your help, like we can, you know, try to layer those out to where, you know, big events can all be played a little bit more. I, I mean, I, I'm sure it's a nightmare sitting there and trying to figure out, but somehow it's worked for 
20, 30 years, you know, but I don't, I don't know if that's because we have so many more events or definitely have have more events. Yeah. And the top tier of events have really become its own, its own beast as well. Right. You know, Jen, we started playing in a, in an era where, um, you know, you had to find a tiers yeah. And, and, and you had to drive multiple states three, to get yes, to that. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. You know, I, I was tournament director in the mid 2000s. I think I ran the first non Beaver State Fling A tier in the state of Oregon, and that was in 2010. So that's it's not that not long that ago. Long not ago. that many, you know. <laughs> so so the, for the ago. fact that we have that wow. top tier of events, right? And now all of the historical and classic you know, regional events that you described, it's it's going to become more complex to, to fit everything in. But I think it is a better, um, it's a better reality today than it was previously. Um, and you mentioned something about there being more events. I was looking at the last three years of tournaments. So over 10,000 tournaments in 2023. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot How of many do, do we know, predict? I, I know there will still be so many more pop up. At, sure. you know, towards the end of 2024, but like currently what's it looking like stacking up and oh, looking ahead, that... you mean into 24? Yeah. Like you said there was 10,000 in 2023. Yeah. Do we, yeah. So in like 2022, I think there was around 8,000, 2021 around 7,000. So, okay. you know, it's growing. In 2024 will probably be like 12,000. Yeah. Anywhere between 10 to 12 would be awesome. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's trending up is, is, is the takeaway. And, and that is, that's a good thing, I think. And it's great for, for all these new players. Right. So yes. Grant and I, you know, always say like all these new, you know, mm-hmm. COVID error babies. Um, but for those of us who have played 20 years, that's probably, we're the ones that are like, oh my gosh, what's going on. But all these new players are like, oh my gosh, I got a tournament here and a tournament here and yeah. a tournament here. And it's incredible, but it's those, you know, veterans here that are like, I can't play the same. Yeah, Yeah, we have to make tougher choices now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So those of us who have history, I think it may be just a little bit harder, but I'm sure it is, you know, amazing to flip on PDGA schedule and see, oh, there's eight different A tiers I can play within 30 minutes. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. When you were talking a minute ago, not to not to take your job, Dion, but when you were talking a minute ago uh, about the idea of some kind of a mechanism where a pro player can choose between event A or event B on any given weekend as they're building out, you know, a touring schedule for the year. It made me think from an amateur angle on the same topic, the number of times that I'm on the road for my job at the PDGA, but I'm on the road and I find myself somewhere that otherwise I would never I would never go, you know, I'll, I'll be uh, within the next year. I'll be, I think in the Milwaukee area once, you know, and I would probably never have a reason to go there. Sure. But now that I know I'm going there, I want to play, I want to play a course or two, but I don't know which courses to play the same kind of mechanism for me to be able to look maybe up some courses in the area and not only be able to rely on just, you know, stars or something on some kind of online rating or, or on uh, another platform's rating, but to be able to dig into it a little bit and go, which courses would I have the most fun at? You know, I've only got enough free time to play twice. Can't play all of them. So I can play twice, which two should I do? You could use the same kind of tool. And instead of looking at things like, uh, you know, prize money and things like that, as a pro needs to do, you could look, at different parameters as an amateur and determine, you know, how you're going to take advantage of finding yourself on a business trip somewhere that you otherwise wouldn't have gone. Cause you, you, you may, you may never go back to that place. Mm-hmm. Yep. You'd hate to feel like you missed out on an opportunity to play a really neat course or whatever. So the, I, I think what we're, what we're getting to in this conversation is that the possibilities from this acquisition of stat Mando are kind of endless it's yeah. just a matter of putting together the data and finding the way to deliver it. And yeah. that's what we're going to see unfold. How quickly? Starting fairly quickly in 2024? Oh, definitely. You know, the the only constraints to limit that progress is the real world constraints of time and energy. You know, because <laughs> the passion is there, right? We got to go find the data, get the data, aggregate the data, package it up and deliver it. And if you can, if you can sort of create that train and the momentum builds up, then you, you get there sooner rather than later, but it takes time. It takes energy. It takes the right skill set. So, um, yeah, we're super excited, right? The, 
there's more ideas to do than than time to actually implement right. them. So so that's one of the key functions of of my role as well, which is, all right, let's all get all the ideas out there. That's really the fun part. And now let's figure out which ones deliver the most value soonest, mm -hmm. right? And then we build those first. That that it's a really simple concept, but it's really hard to implement because the things that might sound the most fun and exciting, right? These little features that we're describing may or may not be used by everybody, right? And so we have to be really cognizant. Am I building a, an app for, you know, the hundred touring pros in the world, right? That's mm -hmm. a very specific audience, right? Or am I building an app for the 140,000 members out there, right? right? So we need to be really careful about what we select or really intentional, I should say, about what we select. Um, but yeah, it's all there. It's all possible. We, we are excited to deliver that. It will take time, but that's the whole point. Yeah. Grant, when you were describing like finding a course in a new area, it'd be fun. Not only saying, is it a wooded or whatever? Like, is there any history? Like I, I love yeah, the sure. history of disc golf. Like, was this the sixth course ever designed in the United States or was there a world championship, you know, at this course, things like that, like course history, yeah. when you click on it, I think would be so cool mm -hmm. to know because yes, you can look up pars, you can look up, you know, all the other stuff out there on a course, mm -hmm. but tell me the history of a course, you sure. know, when was it designed? Who was it designed by? Yep. Um, you know, what happened, you know, what records were broken at this course, things yeah. like that. I think personally, even playing as many courses as I played or even the courses that I, I know and play, I probably don't know half the stats that, or, you know, history that's happened at those courses. So course history would, would be super cool to know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Cause I don't and, think that's out there. Well, all that history lives within the, in the local community that supports yes. that course. Right. So, so this is my call to action to all the, the clubs and, and, and course designers and tournament directors out there in the world, get that information, right. I will start providing those tools or the PDGA will not, not me. I can't code anything. You don't want me on the keyboard. Right? <laughs> you know, PDGA will provide those tools, right. The whole point is to capture that information. So it doesn't go away. Right. right. Because whoever knows that right now is not going to be around forever exactly. and we're going to lose that history. So we have to capture it. So yeah. so that is really important. I really appreciate that perspective, Jen. Yeah. I mean, that was literally, I think, one of the main reasons I told Grant I would love to do this show is I would love to sit there and document and talk to all of these people who started the sport that I love so much. And this last year, 2023, I feel like we we've been able to talk to like so many and and getting to know the women and all these women who have now came back to play like that was more joy to me you know than than most of my wins you know yeah. it's i love the history of the game and so to know that soon there could be more you know history out there that i can sit there and and look up or know is is really cool yeah, absolutely. I'll, I want to share a quick story with you, Jen, that you'll appreciate, which is uh, first disc I ever owned, I found on hole 18 at the end of my very first round uh, in the summer of 2003. So Colin Sexton, you know, brought me out to a Lambert disc golf course in Corvallis. We play the, the 18 holes. You know, I'm having so much fun. I can't believe how awesome it is. And on the 18th green, there's an orange champion four-time JK Val Valkyrie. Right. And I pick it up. It's brand new. Like they just bought it that day, forgot to put their name and number on it. So I just find this unmarked disc. It's like, and a present. like it's like Christmas. It, it, it basically sealed my future in the sport. Right. <laughs> so it's like I got this disc and, uh, you know, I didn't know who Juliana Corver was, didn't, you know, nothing. So in 2021, we went out to MVP Open and did a, a lot of fun stat collection on the ground there. I see Juliana walking through and I'd, I'd never met her. Right. So she came back into the sport and yep. I walked up to her and I told her that story. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I love that Mando. My mom loves it. You know, and I was just like I was crying. I started crying. I was just like your disc got me into the sport, <laughs> you know, and her to thank me about Stat Mando and me to thank her about, you know, being a part of my history. Like uh, it was a magical moment. Right. You know, and so I was so hoping you were about to say it was her disc and she lost it. Oh, like, my her gosh. Actual, like her actual disc. Yeah. She's like, yeah, my name's on the front of the disc. Yeah. I don't have to That's put my name I, on the back. Yeah. 
Okay, that happens a lot. Like, Jen, you, your name. I'm like, I signed that. That's actually yeah. not mine. Please try to get that back to its original <laughs> owner. Yeah. But yeah, if we make that into a movie, I think we should make it. That was JK's. We'll disc. update it to her disc. Okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if but we I do, like, as that... pros, like, we, we don't have the time, and I don't think a lot of us have the energy or whatever. And there's some really smart people that play disc golf, but I don't think a lot of us are back there behind textbooks and computers looking up, you know, stats and information. So it is super fun. And, you know, back when JK started playing, and I'll say when I started playing, there weren't those stats weren't out there at all. Right. Like, you know, there, how many of the first, what the first 10 years they had to go back and maybe like put in the information. There was no, you know, they had to put it from paper, yeah, paper. into mm -hmm. a database. Yep. yep. <laughs> so like that's things that we, you know, we didn't have when she was playing the sport in the beginning, like that stuff wasn't there. Right. So for her to be able to look and like, Oh my gosh, this is what I did. I'm, I'm sure she absolutely you know, loves to see her accomplishments because, yeah. you know, careers are roller coasters. So you dip down, you think, oh, well, maybe it wasn't, you know, all that. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. The year when you only, uh, gosh, I better butcher the stat. This is why we need Evan with us at all times. Uh, he actually knows, he knows all these things. Hop him but, in. <laughs> yeah, a season where Juliana won basically every tournament and only lost, I think, one event and only had one person beat her in an entire year. You know, yeah. so mm -hmm. things like that are just historically significant. And that was a big reason we wanted to do what we did. It's it's adding that weight and history to the the stories that are out there. But now we can make it tangible with, throughout that day. Yeah. When I started playing, she was kind of exiting and then Des was taking over. So yeah. I, I competed against Des so much. And then Des did basically the same thing. You know, Des yep. won everything. You yep. never saw her make a mistake. Like she just didn't make mistakes. But then... Um, it was at Ledgestone. I wouldn't know the year, but here we all are. This card of 15,000 PDGA members. It was myself, JK and Leslie. And I'll always call, I'll, I'll say the wrong last name, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but here we all are. And I look and I'm watching them play and all of our PDGA numbers are 15,000 and whatever. And I'm like, that's where I got my putt and I kicked my leg up to the sky. Like these, yeah. these women <laughs> were the women that were who I got to see play in my very, you know, and early, you know, 99, 2000 era when I started. Yep. And so it is cool to, to see them come back and be like, Oh yeah. Like I remember. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very exciting. Yeah. Well, hey, this is how we land the plane. You just brought up Evan uh, as one of the three original founders of Stat Mando that's now part of the PDGA staff. The PDGA staff is now uh, just over 40 strong, if you can believe it. And we are a busy group of 40 plus people. Uh, there is no off season for us. And uh, so much planning is already going into effect, not only for 2024, but for 2025 and beyond. And we're just cranking out the work. You, uh, Dion and Evan and Hans, can you give me just a little quick, you know, synopsis of what your roles are now as part of the PDGA family? Yeah, absolutely. So I've talked a little bit about myself. I'll be the director of product, um, you know, just trying to figure out what adds value and, and then deliver on those things. Uh, Hans and Evan are going to both work in the technology org, um, and Hans is, you know, top tier software developer. We have our Satmando platform that needs to be, you know, either integrated into the PDGA or or revamped now that we have um, direct access to the the, the true database, right? Um, and then Evan, you know, is such a flexible player. He's a great software developer. He's going to be on the tech team. Um, I, I would like to see him continue his role as someone who really curates the stats and the data and can generate a lot of content for the sport, um, and for media and, and for everybody. Uh, so he he's a very flexible player, right? So um, not only does he have the, the technology background, but because he has that sports analyst hat, I feel like we'll probably see Evan in a lot of different domains at the PDGA. Does he watch well, ESPN like 24 seven? He's one of those guys that knows like every player when they started, when they just like, just rattles it out. He doesn't need to look it up. 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I haven't gotten into too many other sports conversations with him, but yes, he pretty much knows everything. So that's awesome. Well, the exact way we're going to uh, explain the brand to people moving forward, is it going to be Stat Mando powered by PDGA? Is it going to be some other interesting relational brand? That remains to be seen. But the fact of the matter is Stat Mando remains, and you'll have every opportunity to enjoy Stat Mando products, to get to start using them for yourself as a member of the PDGA. You'll, of course, continue to see Stat Mando uh, featured as part of Disc Golf Network broadcast. And it's all because of uh, the work of Dion, Evan, and Hans, and now the acquisition of Statmando to the PDGA. So we really appreciate your time, Dion. I know how busy you are here. All three of us are working during that week between Christmas and New Year's when most of the world seems like they're off. But we've got stuff to do, and we're having a great time doing it. Uh, viewers and listeners of this podcast will get a chance to see this in early 2024. And by then, who knows, there might even be more news to announce. So thanks again, Dion. We really appreciate it. And we're going to see you down the road. All right. Thank you both.